The time for April's dividend reinvestment has rolled around and I want to tell you about the stock that I picked for my dividend growth investment. It's a new stock for the portfolio but my wife and I have owned shares in the stock for years. Hi, I'm Dave Van Knapp with the Dividends and Income channel. Please click the thumb up button if you like this content. Uh, Press the button to subscribe to the channel and ring the bell so that you get notifications when we put new videos up or if you get a reply to a comment that you leave uh, underneath the video. If you saw my video uh, on March Madness, which was modeled after the NCAA college basketball tournament that recently ended, you know that I had five brackets of potential um, teams or stocks, those brackets, with some information about each one to give you a little idea of why they were in the bracket at all and uh, some information to get you started on your own research. I didn't do a rundown of the, I didn't play the tournament, so to speak, with those brackets, but I did go through the stocks and just using the information that was presented in the bracket slides themselves, I isolated four stocks that seemed to be among the best out of the 80 that were in the five brackets. One of those is T. Rowe Price, shown here in the bracket that it appeared in, uh, with information that shows that they have a long streak of dividend increases, a very high dividend safety score, a decent yield of 3.5%, and a five-year dividend growth rate of 15%. Those qualities enough uh, allowed T. Rowe Price to finish in the top four of the brackets. And as I did further research for what I was going to reinvest in this month, I ended up focusing on T. Rowe Price. Before I buy anything, I rate stocks according to uh, several rating scales. One of them is my quality snapshot scale, which is shown here. In the left column are the trusted sources I use for various ratings. In the middle column are the rating factors that I use. And in the right column, where it says points, I rate each factor on a scale of zero to five points, depending on how good it is for the particular company that I'm looking at. There being five factors times five points, that means the maximum total score a company can get is 25. And the way I interpret the scores is shown at the bottom of this slide, 23 to 25 points are, is at the top of the scale, considered to be excellent, I color it dark green, and so on down across the, um, the rating scale until you get to 15 points. 15 points is my cutoff, my personal cutoff for investing in something. If a company can't garner 15 um, points on this scale, I consider it risky and speculative. And while I normally wouldn't, I, I, while I might possibly take a calculated risk every so often and invest in something, with a score that low, normally I won't invest in anything that can't get 15 points on this simple system. Now keeping that system in mind, here is how T. Rowe Price scores on it. And as you can see from all the green, it scores great. Uh, the highest value line safety grade, the second highest value line financial strength grade. Interestingly, on the Standard & Poor's credit rating, T. Rowe Price, as we'll see a little later, operates with no debt. So it doesn't need a credit rating and it does not have a credit rating for um, from Standard & Poor's. I've decided to score that as above average. I think it's remarkable that a company of any size can run itself without borrowing any money. But uh, that's what T. Rowe Price does. The Morningstar Moat rating is the wide moat, which is Morningstar's highest rating. And the Simply Safe Dividends safety grade is in the highest tier of grades, 94 out of 100 points, which is very safe. Overall, T. Rowe Price gets 23 uh, out of 25 points for a grade of A on its quality snapshot. Now, as a dividend growth investor, I pay particular attention to a company's dividend resume. And again, I score it according to a dividend snapshot system that's not unlike the quality snapshot system that uh, I just explained. Here is the dividend snapshot system. Again, the left column shows the trusted sources I use to derive certain information. The factors themselves are shown in the middle column, and the points, again, are on a zero to five 
five system for each factor. There are six factors, but I count the top one. Simply Safe Dividend Safety Score appears again in this rating scale as well as in the first one. I double the score here, so there's a total of 35 total points available. And at the bottom, again, I show how I interpret those from very high scores of 31 to 35 points down to scores below 20. I say on this slide, not good enough. I would not invest in a company as a dividend growth investor uh, who, that couldn't score at least 20 points using these factors and my scoring system. This display shows how T. Rowe Price scores on that system that I just described. And again, you can see all the green T. Rowe Price scores great. It has, a, as we've already seen, a high tier dividend safety score from Simply Safe Dividends. It's increased its dividend annually every year without fail for 35 years in a row. It yields 3.5%, which is pretty good. Its most increase just uh, made in February with dividends paid in February was 11.1%, which is fast. Its five-year dividend growth rate is even a little faster at 15% a year. And if you look at the trend of dividend increases over the last 10 years, you see that T. Rowe Price's annual increase has been steadily in double digits, which is an excellent record. Overall, T. Rowe Price gets 33 out of the 35 points available on the dividend snapshot score, and that rates an A as well. I will just mention that, uh, in case you're not familiar with the company, T. Rowe Price is an asset manager, meaning that they uh, their products consist of mutual funds, target date funds, and all kinds of investment products that they sell to companies to use in their 401ks. They sell to individual investors uh, such as us. Being in that business, uh, that's called asset light, meaning that they don't have factories, they don't have trucks, they don't have heavy equipment, they don't have a lot of things that many companies have to, with their capital, to maintain. That means that T. Rowe Price is able to generate uh, a lot of free cash flow, and then they turn around and distribute that back to shareholders in the company via dividends. That also helps uh, T. Rowe Price investors in the company. So T. Rowe Price is my pick for my dividend reinvestment this month, but since it's a new position and a new stock that I've never presented before, I want to take a little time to go a little deeper into, into it so you get a better under, understanding of the company. Let's start this deeper dive with a look at the long-term challenges that face T. Rowe Price. This slide is from T. Rowe Price's 2021 investor presentation. It's almost a year old. They haven't done 2022's presentation yet, but the thing shown on this slide are still pertinent, and I've highlighted a few of them. Um, target date competition, meaning that T. Rowe Price feels competition in its uh, markets from target date funds, and they are busily introducing target date funds of their own. Accelerating interest in alternatives ref refers to investor interest in things that go beyond plain vanilla mutual funds into alternate asset, into bond funds, into target date funds. Passive and pricing pressure actually should be two bullets. It's two different things. Passive pressure on the business means that there is a growing interest among investors in passive funds, which are known generally as exchange-traded funds, whereas Hero Price's products tend to be mutual funds, which are not passive, they're active, but they're uh, losing favor in the marketplace, and that's a headwind for for uh, T. Rowe Price. Pricing pressure is one that we've all seen. There's pressure across the investment asset industry to lower fees. I think all of us, all of you watching this video probably make your trades without paying any commission at all. I know that I do. And ETFs are facing lower fees and mutual funds are facing a trend and a demand from customers for lower fees. And the bottom uh, item I highlighted here, demand for vehicles beyond mutual funds, We've kind of already gone over that. Uh, investors are looking more for target date funds, heavy emphasis nowadays on retirement oriented products. And of course, they're looking for ETFs that tend to have lower fee structures than the traditional mutual funds that form the bulk of T. Rowe Price's product offerings. This slide is from the same investor presentation last year, so it's just slightly out of date, but it is still pertinent. T. Rowe Price presented this to its investors to show 
its great record in growing AUM, which stands for Assets Under Management, over the past 10 years. You can see that assets under management, with one slight exception, have grown every year over the last 10 years and that they really took off uh, starting three years ago or so. AUM is important to an asset manager because they tend to operate to make their own revenue on the basis of fees charged, which are usually charged as a percentage of assets. So the more assets under management a, a, an asset manager has, the more fees they they can collect and the more their revenue uh, is enhanced by the fact that they're managing more money. I need to say this, however, most of that growth in AUM is attributable to the strong stock markets over the same time period covered by this slide. Hero Price actually had net client outflows, meaning uh, their own customers were withdrawing money from T. Rowe Price funds in 2021 and if you look back it's not shown on this slide but if you look back all the way to about 2014 hero prices growth in cash inflows from customers as opposed to growth from market prices going up has been pretty flat for the last six seven eight years this slide is also from the same presentation that was just on the screen so it's a little out of date but it's still pertinent in this slide T. Rowe Price was attempting to show its investors what it's doing to strategically address the headwinds that it faces from the trends that we saw. It's enhancing its target date offerings, enhancing both by reducing fees and by introducing new target rate products. It's re expanding its retirement capabilities. The retirement market for asset managers is growing by leaps and bounds. I believe that the statistic is something like 10,000 people per day in the United States turn 65, which is the traditional retirement age. And as people retire, of course, they are interested and become more interested. I can speak from experience myself become more interested in their investments and how they're going to finance their retirement. In the middle column, I highlighted the bullet that says expand wealth management relationships. They're looking here to improve and increase the ways that they distribute their products. And the bottom item that I also highlighted addresses the exact same thing where they talk about rolling out enhanced advertising and marketing campaign for their uh, relevant products to the um, growing retirement market. More recent than that uh, slide from mid-2021, in their 10K filing at the end of uh, last fiscal year, Hero Price said that they are, uh, mentioned a couple of other initiatives they're pursuing to enhance their uh, product distribution capabilities and to enhance our product lines. At the end of uh, 2021, T. Rowe Price completed the acquisition of another asset manager known as Oak Hill Advisors, which was a $57 billion acquisition, a big acquisition by T. Rowe Price. Oak Hill is an alternative credit firm that will enhance T. Rowe Price's ability to offer those kinds of products. Also last year, as stated in their recent annual report, T. Rowe Price completed a uh, joint venture with uh, Schwab, the investment brokerage, that will uh, allow Schwab to emphasize distributing T. Rowe Price mutual funds and low, other low-cost products that T. Rowe Price has or will introduce, again, as it tries to expand its marketing to a broader array of advisors and retail investors like us. Having addressed the headwinds and the strategies that T. Rowe Price has to counter those headwinds, I wanted to show you this slide because it shows you how great um, elements of T. Rowe Price's financials are. In the upper left column is T. Rowe Price's total sales, which means its revenues over the past 10 years. And you can see the annual growth in revenues and the, um, the way that growth has taken off in the last four or five years, which is where I drew the red arrow. The caveat on this um, great record, of course, is what I said before. A lot of the revenue growth has come because of growth in the markets, not because uh, more in individuals or companies with their 401k plans and so on are buying T. Rowe Price products. In the lower left, this one makes me smile. I mentioned 
earlier that T. Rowe Price operates with no debt. Well, this is what that looks like. There are only a couple of tiny little columns across this 10-year chart. The, the line across the top or the middle of this display, Simply Safe Dividends, which is where I got all of these um, wonderful graphs from, likes to see the debt level for an asset manager to be below that. Well, you can't get any far, farther below uh, that particular benchmark than zero, and that's where T. Rowe Price is. In the upper right corner, we see T. Rowe Price's operating margin over the last 10 years. Remember I said T. Rowe Price has an asset light business model, which means that it can be profitable because it's not paying out money for things like factories and heavy equipment. The line drawn across by Simply Safe Dividends is at 25% uh, operating margin, and you can see that T. Rowe Price's operating margin is consistently just about twice that benchmark in the 40% and up range. And in the lower right, I also mentioned previously that T. Rowe Price has an ongoing share repurchase program. This shows the total shares outstanding, so T. Rowe Price isn't only purchasing those shares and then using them to compensate its executives and employees. It's actually retiring some of them. So you can see the slow decline eat every year in the number of shares outstanding. And overall, a declining share count is advantageous to us as investors in the company. So taking all of that those things into account, the, the, the great positives and the headwinds and the strategies to counter the headwinds, I've decided to, to uh, invest in T. Rowe Price. It's been in the asset management business for decades, and over those decades, of course, it's had to um, deal with many, many uh, changes in the industry. And so my investment in, in T. Rowe Price amounts to a, I'm putting my money on the line, that T. Rowe Price will continue to figure out ways to cope with the investment industry, which changes all the time, especially with technology, uh, the lowering fee structure, and the introduction of new products, including the proliferation of ETFs that I've talked to you guys about in other videos. Valuation-wise, investing in T. Rowe Price at this time is a no-brainer, and I will quickly show you three of the four valuation metrics I use and then tell you how my valuation uh, calculations uh, lead me to that conclusion. This slide from Fast Graphs shows two of the, of the metrics that I'm going to show you. The two colored lines, the blue line and the pink line, are fair value estimates based on approaches that Fast Graphs uses. The black line is T. Rowe Price's actual price. The gray band going vertically down this chart in early 2020 is the COVID um, recession. It's hard to believe, but we're two years removed from the COVID recession and recovery from that recession, even though we're all still dealing in many cases with some aspects of COVID. T. Rowe Price's stock price dropped during that recession, as shown here, and as we're often, uh, most stocks did at that time. Then it recovered, as most stocks did, but T. Rowe Price's recovery probably overshot the mark. I've shown it by the red arrow that I drew here. The price continued from being undervalued based on both of those fair value reference lines right through the first one, right through the second one, peaking out um, in, the, in the third quarter of last year at an overvalued price. Since then, its price has dropped and then leveled out over the last few weeks, as shown on the at the tail end of the price line by my green arrow. But at this time, you can tell from this that T. Rowe price is about fairly valued based on the pink reference line and pretty much undervalued based on the blue reference line. This display shows you another way that I calculate valuation, which is to compare a stock's current yield with its yield over the past five years. The idea is that if a stock is yielding more now than it's been yielding historically or in the recent history of five years, it probably suggests that its price is undervalued currently because price and, and yield are inversely, inversely related. So as price goes down, yield goes up. And that's the situation that we have here. We saw T. Rowe Price's price decline in the last uh, year or so of the price chart in the previous slide. And now here we see the inverse effect on the yield. The yield goes up uh, since looks like late 2021 to its current point of it's shown as 
5% on this slide, and I actually took the slide a day or two before I bought the stock. It's gone up a little more since then, which means its price has declined a little more since then. The price, the, the yield rather, T. Rowe price is quite a bit above its five-year average yield, and that's another factor from which we can infer that its price is probably undervalued. I did all the math, and this slide shows my conclusions about T. Rowe Price's valuation. The fair price range is in the middle, the yellow part of the slide. I think T. Rowe, price, T. Rowe Price's fair price is in the $164 to $181 per share range, or alternatively looking at its at fair value as a yield, that at a fair price, T. Rowe Price would be yielding 2.7 to 2.9%. Above $181, I think, is too much to spend, and I wouldn't recommend buying T. Rowe Price, but we don't have to worry about that at the moment because T. Rowe Price's actual price is way below that. The discount range I consider to be anything under $164, which translates to a yield of 2.9, uh, higher than 2.9%. At its current price of around $141 and yield of 3.45%, I find the T. Rowe price is considerably undervalued, 17% undervalued, which is a great buying opportunity if you're interested in the stock. This is a new type of display that I developed just for this video. I hope you guys like it. Let me know in the comments if you like it. It's got the same information basically as the previous slide, but presents it in a way that may be a little easier to, to appreciate. Um, the, top, the top line is the title. The next line is T. Rowe Price's price and the yield the row below that is uh, its yield and I put in the numbers there with more uh, granularity than I had in the previous slide and I drew the blue arrow to show where T row price where I was able to purchase T row price at around $141 which is well into the green undervalued and at a yield uh, slightly over 3.4 percent if that arrow were to move up uh, to the right it would go through lesser scales of being undervalued into the fair value range, which I, which is all yellow on this slide, and which I said was 164 to 181 dollars. And then if it went further to the right, it would become a slowly overvalued and then very overvalued. Okay, that brings us to the close of uh, my deeper look at T. Rowe Price. This slide summarizes everything about T. Rowe Price. Its sector is the financial sector. Its industry is asset management. It's a large cap company with a capitalization of $32.8 billion. And across the bottom are the scores we've seen, the 23 out of 25 points on its quality snapshot, the 33 out of 35 points on its dividend snapshot, its undervaluation of 17%. And in the right lower right corner, I also took a look at Wall Street. They are not as high on T. Rowe Price as I ha am right now. It does not have a, a consensus buy rating. It has a consensus hold rating. I don't care. My own analysis leads me to think that this is a good time to buy T. Rowe Price and that it's going to figure out ways around the changes in its industry as it has for the decades that it's been in existence. On Thursday, April 14th, I got my shares of T. Rowe Price at a little under $141 per share, which is well within the discounted range, gives me a yield of 3.45% on the shares that I bought. I bought three shares, total cost of $422, and the dividend income from those three shares newly added to the portfolio will increase my annual dividend run rate by uh, a little over $14 a year. Obviously, right now, T. Rowe Price is a very small starter position, but my intent is to build it so long as its business holds up and I can get it at a discounted price, as I did here. This display shows the impact on my whole portfolio's income of that purchase of T. Rowe Price. Before I bought those three shares, I had a dividend run rate annual dividend run rate of $55, $55 per year, which is an 11.9% yield on cost. After buying the three purchases and adding the $14 in dividend income, the run rate is now $5,569 per year. That was not enough of an increase to change the yield on cost when it's rounded to one decimal point. However, 
Uh, please remember that what 11.9% yield on costs means is that the portfolio is now sending me cash each year at the rate of 11.9% compared to the original value that I spent on the portfolio when I began it in 2008. In previous videos, we've been over the reasons that the dividend run rate goes up in a portfolio portfolio like mine. Uh, and I won't show you the general slide that describes all of them. I will just show you the two specific ones that are pertinent to my portfolio right now. Number one, reason number one, is that stocks increase their dividends. This slide shows all the increases that have been made to be paid out on stocks that are in my portfolio this year. And I've highlighted in yellow two of them that have come to my attention or that have been announced since the last time I showed you this slide. A really tiny increase from realty income and a 5% annual increase from Procter & Gamble. If you look to the bottom of the slide, you can see that so far we've got 16 uh, increases announced on the 31 stocks in the slide for a total of about $148 added to the annual dividend run rate, which amounts to 2.7% increase just from dividend increases alone. The next slide, shown here addresses the second reason that the dividend run rate goes up which is the dividend reinvestments that i make each month this one shows the four i've made so far this year including the one we've talked about in this video the three shares of t row price that added 14 dollars to the to the dividend stream and at the bottom you can see that through those four purchases so far this year, I've added $64 to the annual dividend run rate, which amounts to 1.2 so far this year. Through April, that's one third of the year. So if you multiply by three, you can see that I'm on track to increase the dividend run rate by three times 1.2 or 3.6% per year simply by reinvesting dividends, which I do at the middle of every month in this portfolio. Okay, here's the overall view of my portfolio um, that gives you the portfolio in summary form. The market value has risen to $179,000, which is 16% more than about a year ago. The number of positions with the addition of T. Rowe Price, I had sold out of a position earlier this year, but now I've added one back. So I'm back to 31 positions, which is where I was a year ago. The current yield is 3.1%. Um, that's down a little bit from a year ago, but that's actually good news. It's down mostly because of the great increase in the value of the portfolio. Again, yield moves inversely to price. So as the, the market value of the portfolio has gone up, its current yield has gone down a little bit. That does not mean, and don't make the mistake of, of thinking that that reduction in current yield means that things are going bad on the dividend income front. They are not. The dividends are going up steadily, uh, as I've discussed several times. The annual dividend run rate is now $5,569 a year, which is 9.7% per more than it was a year ago when it was in the, uh, the low 5,000. The yield on costs, as we are, we've already seen, is 11.9%. A year ago it was 10.9 percent and i didn't add up the dividends collected through the middle of the month i will add those up at the end of the month those are always available online in the most recent portfolio summary that's on the dividends and income site uh, through the end of march i had collected 1424 dollars in dividends so far this year compared to uh almost equivalent time last year when I collected $1,286. So you can see my collection of dividends, the rate at which I collect them is going up. While you're looking at the full portfolio, I'll give you these facts about it. The positions are sorted alphabetically by ticker symbol. I began the portfolio in 2008 to demonstrate dividend growth investing. Its initial, initial value was just under $47,000. Now it's worth more than $179,000, which is 283% total growth. That growth has been achieved with no new money ever added. That means all the growth is organic, meaning that it has come from market price increases combined with dividend raises that we looked at, dividend reinvestments that we looked at, and finally, occasional swaps and changes that I make to the composition of the portfolio itself. I started with 10 positions in 2008. I now have 31 positions. The annual income goes up at a little more than 10% per year, and the yield on cost, as we saw, has now reached 11 points. 
0.9%. Guys, thanks for watching. That's the end of this video. I will see you next time. Bye-bye. <music>